Welcome to the Copper Spice YouTube channel, and thanks for joining us. In this video, we're going to discuss threads as they pertain to C++. Modern C++ Threads We want to start by defining what a thread is, and avoid using the word thread in the definition, which is a very common problem. Understanding the value of threads increases the likelihood you will use them. We also want to talk about what changed in C++11 regarding threads. Every program has at least one main thread. So even if you have never written a multi-threaded program, your code is always running in a thread. A multi-threaded program is one which has more than just the one main thread. There is nothing special about the code in a thread. However, each thread has its own call stack. The main concerns in a multi-threaded program are dealing with shared resources, like data stored on the heap. As soon as you start looking at multi-threaded program design, a term that you need to be aware of is data race. A data race can only occur in a multi-threaded program, and it occurs when all of these conditions happen. If you have multiple threads accessing the same memory location, at least one of those operations is a write, and there is no ordering specified on those separate operations, then you have a data race. It's called a race because conceptually it's not clear what operation happens first, and so the result is unpredictable. As we move forward, we also want to distinguish between different forms of simultaneous execution. This area is often divided into parallelism and concurrency. Parallelism is defined as the case when the independent operations have no need to communicate with one another and they are working on entirely separate data. In the parallelism case, it's very easy to avoid data races because there is no shared data. When you are developing a concurrent solution to a problem, it means that you are doing several operations simultaneously, but they are accessing in some fashion the same data, and these processes are not working independently. This is when you need to be cautious of data races and design your solutions so that it avoids them. So what is the value of using threads? They can make your program faster, but not always. This is sort of like having two cooks in the kitchen. If they are each working on separate things or helping one another, then dinner might be prepared a bit sooner. If the two cooks are competing for counter space or a shared resource, then there might not be an advantage to having the two cooks in the kitchen. So the decision to use threads and write a multi-threading program needs to be based on the idea that your program will be more efficient as a multi-threaded program. Another example to consider is if you're doing a barbecue. One person should be assigned the job of barbecuing the hamburgers so nothing gets burnt. Delegating this task to one cook is a good breakdown and it's not intended for speed, but rather as a division of responsibility. The same idea applies to multi-threading. There may be times when you want to divide your program into separate threads. This is for clarity and not for performance. Before C++11, you could use a threading library like pthreads or boost threads. However, there was no support for threads in the language. Thread support was officially added to the language in C++11. One of the things to know about threads is they can catch an exception. Exceptions can be thrown in a thread, but if the exception is thrown out of the thread, std terminate will be called and the program will end. This is probably not what you intended. Another thing about threads is that if you do not wait for all the threads to finish, it is possible that the main thread could finish and their program will exit. This means the threads that were running in the background will be killed. Again, probably not something you intended. Before C++11, there was no memory model in the standard. And so the moment you used a third-party library to start a separate thread, 
you were stepping outside the guarantees that the standard provides you. It then became very important to understand exactly how your compiler worked. Because you needed to ask questions like, what does it mean for multiple threads to access the same memory? If a thread writes to memory, it needs a write memory barrier to ensure the changes actually happen. How do you make your compiler do this? There were no language requirements to help you on this task. Since the compiler's optimizer was allowed to muck with the order of memory accesses your thread might make, it was very difficult to get this right. One very exciting new feature added in C++11, along with the threading library, was the memory model. It was added to the core language, and the memory model provides a guarantee regarding what it means to access memory. It actually defined the semantics of when your program makes accesses, either read or write, to the memory in your computer. The memory model also gave us the definition of data race. And it said a correct multi-threaded program must never commit a data race. Here is the abstraction the C++ threading library provides. When your program starts, a main thread is set up. New threads can be created and parameters can be passed to them. When a thread has completed, it will automatically terminate. Your program will terminate when all of the threads, including the main thread, have completed. After you start a new thread, you must join or detach the new thread from the main thread. If you fail to do this and leave the scope where the thread was instantiated, the destructor for the new thread will be called and your program will simply terminate. Here's an abstract representation of some of the behavior that you can get in a multi-threaded environment. One of the important things to know is that threads do not run in any predictable order and they can run at the same time. So given this pseudocode and assuming that the print function prints a character at a time, we could receive any of these possible outputs. The first three outputs are readable, but only the first one is likely to be the output you wanted. Since these threads can run in any order and interrupt each other, 4 and 5 are also perfectly valid outputs. If the order these operations occur in matters to you, your program will need to enforce some constraints on the order in which it is generated. The API for starting threads is fairly simple. All you need to do is include the thread header and use the std thread class to instantiate a new thread. Once you have started the thread, you can either call the join or detach method, as we mentioned earlier. There are a few other pieces that may be useful in more complex multi-threaded programs. For example, you may want to order your threads by ID and each thread has a unique identifier that can be retrieved. There are also ways for a given thread to say it would like to go to sleep for a certain amount of time or until a certain time. And there is also a yield mechanism to allow other threads to run if they have work to do. So here's a very simple example that shows printing a message from a thread. The code is not very complex. One thing I'd like to call your attention to is the fact that this message will be output between the instantiation of thread 1 and the call to join. The reason for this is that the message cannot be printed before the thread starts, so it must happen after the constructor runs. And it must be printed while the thread is running. The thread must complete before join can return. So the call to join forces this action to complete before the main function will continue. So the join call will block until the thread has completed its work. The intent of this code is for thread 1 to run the hello function. The function yields until the global variable counter has reached 25. Then it prints a message and thread 1 terminates. After the main loop counts to 100, the program ends. However, the thread is reading memory, which has no barriers. This code fits the definition of a data race. The compiler will always try to optimize your code as if you had no data races. 
This could result in the while loop being interpreted as while 0 is less than 25, or some other crazy result. Since there's a data race in this example, this code is actually undefined behavior, and the outcome is unpredictable. One of the ways to prevent data races in your program is to use an atomic data type. These data types provide an abstraction where multiple threads can access a single memory location simultaneously without having a data race. In fact, that is the defining characteristic of an atomic data type, is that simultaneous access to the atomic value is guaranteed not to result in a data race. When you access an atomic data type, the compiler will automatically insert a memory barrier around the data access so that you do not need to use a mutex or a lock or an explicit memory barrier of your own. It's important to understand that while atomic data types are free from data races, they don't insulate you from the fact that your threads can run in any order. So here's a simple example of a structure that looks perfectly reasonable. But the question is, is this structure thread safe and could it be used in a multi-threaded program safely? The answer is no. Because if one thread called increment, while another thread called decrement or get, we would have multiple accesses to the value simultaneously, and this would cause a data race. A very direct way to solve this problem is by using an atomic int for the value. Very little of the code needs to change, because atomic int provides the increment and decrement operators, so we can call those directly. In the get method, we need to call the load function in the atomic value to get the current data. As a side note, STD Atomic is not copyable or movable. However, as of C17, you can initialize value using the value equals one syntax as the rules for object initialization have been refined. Here is a simple example to track how many seats have been booked. The test in the first if is valid code. However, if there are two threads executing this code at the same time, then both could pass the if and both increment the number of seats taken. Even though we are using an atomic int, it would be possible to overbook the number of seats. The approach taken in the second if is to increment first and then do the test. If there are too many seats taken, we decrement seats taken and give back our seat. The second approach will keep us from overbooking, but the value for seats taken may temporarily exceed the maximum number of seats. A better solution is to take advantage of the more complex atomic operations that atomic variables provide. This code is longer and more complicated, but it will likely be faster and it actually makes the intent more clear. This code starts by loading the current value of seats taken into a temporary variable. We then use the compare exchange weak atomic operation to test and update seats taken atomically. The STD atomic data types provide a number of methods like compare exchange weak that modify or test the data they store atomically. In summary, your source code can look just fine, but in a multi-threaded environment, it can be easy to overlook a data race, and even worse to debug. Code which is syntactically correct and valid C++ can have the wrong semantics in a multi-threaded program. For more information about Copper Spice and our other libraries, please visit our website at www.copperspice.com. Thanks for watching our video. We hope you found the content of value. If you have any questions, please feel free to email us or leave a message on our Copper Spice form. Please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and come back in two weeks for our next video.